So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 270 of Stand Up. Joining me today, the co-hosts of Gaslit Nation, Andrea Chalupa and Sarah Kenzior. I am Pete Dominic. It's time to stand up with me right now. Hello, my friends, and thank you very much for pressing play, for downloading, for reviewing, for subscribing to Stand Up. I'm very happy to have you in my life and in my community, especially if you are a paid subscriber. I hope to see you on Wednesday night, not Thursday, Wednesday at 8 this week, normally on Thursday, but this week, it's my daughter's 16th birthday. So first, I'm looking for advice. What does a father get? his daughter for her 16th birthday. I know you're sitting there going, now you're asking three days before? Well, number one, a thinks about it earlier. More importantly, what might a father do for his 16th birthday? What did your dad do? What did your mom do? What could we do? My wife has a couple of ideas up her sleeve, and when COVID, if it ever ends, ends, we're going to maybe get her like a party bus or a limousine with her friends to go into New York City. But right now, under current restrictions, obviously, where we're pretty much not seeing anybody. What should we do? What should I do? Would love your advice. Email me, standupwithpete at gmail.com, and uh, maybe put birthday advice in the subject. Such a great community of people who have taught me so much about parenting. So help me out and give me a suggestion on that one. Wednesday night at 8, we will meet instead. And guess what? Dr. Ruth ben Giat will be our guest in the Zoom. She is a expert, a historian, an expert on authoritarianism and fascism, who has written a new book about all of the strong men. It's called Strong Men, From Mussolini to the President. Unfortunately, there are a lot of books like this out there, a lot of experts getting and getting new respect for their expertise on authoritarianism and fascism. And Ruth ben Giat will be our guest. We'll ask her questions. I'll see if I can give away some books. I hope I'll see you Wednesday at 8 p.m. on Zoom for the Stand Up Happy Hour Hangout Book Club. This is what I'm going to call it. If you're not already a subscriber, sign up now. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or just click on the paid subscription link in the show notes. So it's Monday and we are just... I am just, as I lay this down, it's actually Sunday night. I do the opening segment here with the news, the last 24, and the news dump late on the night before the podcast drops. And so we're 72 hours, and by the time you're listening to this, maybe it's 48 hours. Maybe you're listening to this in 2027, and you could tell us all what's going on, because these podcasts are all archived, of course. Anyway, the president... On his way out, what will he do? Will he sell intelligence? Will he sell pardons? Will he vaporize us all? Will he steal the pillows from the Abe Lincoln bedroom and leave my pillows there instead and also steal everything that has to do with Andrew Jackson? What is he going to do that he still can? So these next two days are going to be really important to watch and see what he does, but it's hard to know because without Twitter, he hasn't really been able to scream his normal volume. So I've got several sound bites related to politics and everything that we've seen in the last couple of days coming up right here in the last 24, where I talk about the news and events that took place in the last 24 hours or so. Always play a bunch of sound bites for you. And then we get on to the news dump, non-political, non-COVID related stories. And of course, as always, my interviews with the best experts I can find. And I know everybody, folks, or I know a lot of people. And unfortunately, the show has been dominated by male voices. It's hard to book the show and host the show and edit the show and promote the show. And one of the things that it's difficult to do around booking is trying to get the right mix of different voices, backgrounds, ethnicities, uh, genders, orientations, all of it. I try to get a diverse 
group of folks on to get different interpretations of things. And I just haven't had enough women on the program. And so this week, it's all ladies all the time. That's the plan, at least. And I'm very excited to share with you. Unfortunately, it's a couple weeks old now, but it's certainly still relevant. My conversation taking you behind the scenes of one of my favorite podcasts hosted by two of my favorite journalists and commentators, Sarah Kenzior and Andrea Chalupa. I'm also experimenting with some video graphics and longtime listener subscriber Dan Leaf's son, Vince, who's 16, lives out there just south of San Diego, and he has been helping me edit some videos. and They look great, so I'm going to release the video that partners with that conversation on my YouTube channel, which I'm trying to get started, youtube.com slash standupwithpete. If you haven't subscribed to that, please do. If you're on YouTube... And you subscribe to channels, subscribe to mine, youtube.com slash stand up with Pete, and I'll get that video, the entire interview up as well. And I've also got some with uh, other guests, and we're going to keep trying to pump those out. So this young man, Vince, is quite the graphic artist and editor and doing a great work for me. So I'm excited about the video elements to stand up that I'm going to be putting more and more out of. YouTube.com slash stand up with Pete. But now it's time for the last 24. Shall we talk about what happened in the last 24 hours? Of course, the Sunday shows, I got some good audio from them, a bunch of audio clips for you that I think are all very relevant, important, and help give context to everything that we're dealing with and talking about right now. First, I want to share with you Yale historian, expert on authoritarianism and fascism. I already mentioned Ruth ben Gia Today, I got Sarah Kenzior and Andrea Chalupa. And now we've got Tim Snyder, or at least audio of him, because he was on CNN on Sunday with the great Ana Cabrera, who always does a great job, asks great questions over at CNN. And Tim Snyder also had an awesome article in the Sunday Times magazine that I read. I highly recommend recommend everything he's written, especially his book on tyranny. I'm just going to keep Anna Cabrera's question in there as she asks it to the great Tim Snyder. Brilliant, as always. I wonder, though, how much accountability is important in all of this as you rebuild, because you've talked a lot about how elected officials help spread the president's big lies. So I'm curious to get your reaction to this tweet from former congressman and presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke. And he says this, don't let Cruz attend the inauguration. His attempt at sedition and his incitement to violent insurrectionists should result in his expulsion from the Senate. He certainly shouldn't be allowed at a celebration of the peaceful transfer of presidential presidential power. Do you think he has a point? He's got a, he's got a bunch of points there. N- number one, Mr. Trump never could have spread the big lie on his own. Without Mr. Without Mr. Cruz, without Mr. Hawley, without a, without a number of other Republicans, that big lie would have never made it out of November into where we are now. Number two, if you are a legislator, if you are elected, and then you call elections into question, you're inviting an attack on the people's house. You're inviting attack on the Capitol. That is exactly what those senators and congressmen did who who doubted um, who doubted the election. So I think there really is a point here. And the final point is that people who call into question American elections, what they're asking for is another chance for themselves. It didn't work in 2020, but maybe it'll work in 2024 to lose an election cry cry fraud and then and then ask for violence that has to be cut off now and so the point about mr cruz and by the way also about mr hawley i think is a very strong one and in the new york times magazine about the big lie professor tim snyder writes america will not survive the big lie just because a liar is separated from power it will need a thoughtful repluralization of media and a commitment to facts as a public good The racism structured into every aspect of the coup attempt is a call to heed our own history. Serious attention to the past helps us see risks, but also suggests future possibility. We cannot be a democratic republic if we tell lies about race, big or small. Democracy is not about minimizing the vote nor ignoring it, neither a matter of gaming nor of breaking a system, but of accepting the equality of others, heeding their voices and counting their votes. Tim Snyder, read the whole article in the New York Times Magazine, read his book on tyranny. Okay, now I want to rant a little bit about how infuriating it has been to watch so many people in mainstream media act shocked and act surprised when thousands of Trump supporters 
flew in from all over the country, took vacation days off, and tried to burn down the Capitol and hang Trump's own vice president, Mike Pence, and do so much worse. I'm nauseated by the talking heads on television and across media, as well as in Congress, acting surprised. I have been talking and more importantly, listening to experts on these issues for almost 15 years. And if you were at all curious and concerned about the threat that is posed by white, anti-government, white supremacists, white nationalist militia types, your Timothy McVeigh's, your three percenters, your Oath Keepers, your Klan members, and now your QAnoners, it was never hard to see. And you didn't, by the way, have to interview experts on hate crimes or domestic terrorism to see it. All you had to do is... Know some people of color and have an honest and thoughtful conversation or, God forbid, or even relationship with them. Because it was never and is not a surprise to people of color living in this country. Black folks, especially, who've been here for generations, doesn't matter where they live, have always seen the threat of white supremacists around every corner. And for Chuck Todd and so many others, and I'll pick on him because I heard it on Meet the Press, to act surprised and say that it was hiding in plain sight. I want to play this for you, and I've got a little bit to react to. When we come back, how the riot at the Capitol was frankly years in the making. Yeah, it was years in the making. And, and, And were you not covering it? I saw it. I covered it. I talked to experts about it all the time. Were there not people in NBC News in the newsroom that were warned about this, that were concerned about this, that were sourcing correspondence and journalists and articles on all of these white supremacists and the type of rhetoric that we were hearing from right wing hate talkers? Were you not hearing that? Were you ignoring it? Were you dismissing it? Were you not concerned about it? Because I certainly was hearing it, and I was concerned about it, and I was making note of it, and I was asking experts about it. Where were you, Chuck Todd? Welcome back. The riot at the Capitol was shocking. Sadly, it was not unpredictable. According to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, right-wing terrorists perpetrated the majority of all plots and attacks in the United States from 1994 to 2020. Yeah, so what else did you need to know? That's the stat, everybody. Right there. It wasn't 9-11 and the other very few, by the way. You can, I think there are less than 10 attacks by brown-skinned Muslims who were militant and had all of those concerns that ISIS and Al-Qaeda and others share. They were very few. Of course, 9-11 was this sensational, horrific, horrible terrorist act. I was there in New York City. I know people who died. But what did we do as a reaction? We invaded two other countries and spent trillions of dollars and thousands of American military members died and millions of people died in those countries as a result of those wars. And our reputation around the world took a horrific hit. And so, of course, did our national debt. But what about the threat in our own backyard, Chuck Todd? What about that? It was happening all over America all the time. It was endemic in police departments around America. And where were the white people screaming about it? Over the past six years, these attacks have occurred in 42 states. In other words, the violence we witnessed on January 6th. No, it hasn't been hiding in plain sight. If you were listening to anybody who was concerned about it, you would have been doing way more segments about it, way more than you ever did on the threat that's Al-Qaeda, because it's preposterously imbalanced. The assault on the Capitol was a culmination of years of rising political violence. They ripped my mask off, stole my equipment, beat me up. Fueled by resentments, exploited by politicians on the right, and accelerated by Donald Trump. We fight, fight like hell. Get your people to fight. And I have to fight much harder. The rhetoric of resentment, legitimizing vigilante justice, and leading to violence is nothing new. Ten years ago, After she voted for President Obama's health care law, Congresswoman Gabby Giffords was shot, along with 18 others, including a federal judge, by a gunman in her Arizona district. Oh, and by the way, so many more of these gunmen were also right wing, crazy young men who were toxically masculine incels. They absolutely are on the right side of the political spectrum. So many of them were ex-veterans or active uh, law enforcement or military. And it was politically incorrect to look at them. Why? Why? Because who's running the show? The Tea Party, broadly formed to limit the size of government, grew online. 
No, 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 no. I was outraged when I heard him say that. The Tea Party that was formed because of the growth of government. Hell no. And that's the thing that outraged me. Chuck Todd sitting here saying, oh, this threat was hiding in plain sight. And within a minute or so later, he then misdiagnoses what the Tea Party was. The Tea Party was 100% a reaction to the black guy. They, their rallying cry was take back our country. From who? From what? And if you don't know that, then ask black people what they thought. Ask any Chuck Todd and certainly ask any scholars who covered the issue for Chuck Todd to say that the Tea Party was formed as a result of the growth of government shows such a dramatic lack of understanding or purposeful, willful ignorance to the truth about it, what it was, that he should immediately give up the chair and meet the press and give it to Kristen Welk or, or any other black person. Because now that we see black voices rising in media all the time, we are seeing more attention to the issues that they care about and having to listen to their daily concerns. And that's good. But you can't have people in that chair in the, in the premier NBC News show and potentially Sunday News show with that kind of ignorance at this point in that kind of segment. Come on, son. Shall we listen to more? How about some false equivalency? Some hot and fresh Chuck Todd false equivalency. He found the one guy on the left who was politically motivated and he made sure to mention him, even though there's been hundreds if not thousands of attacks from right-wing lunatics for his entire career. Mr. Trump's supporters don't have a monopoly on violence. A Bernie Sanders supporter shot four, including Congressman Steve Scalise at a congressional baseball practice in 2017. I am sickened by this despicable act. But unlike Sanders, the president has praised extremists who support him. You also had people that were very fine people on both sides. And the threat has been growing. Donald Trump lit the fuse of a box of dynamite that contained white supremacists, far-right militias, Proud Boys, Boogaloos, neo-Confederates, and many other insurrectionists just waiting for him to call them to action. We're going to be doing much more on how right-wing violence has become a growing terrorist threat on Meet the Press Report, which airs on NBC News Now. And on- All right, well, you're only like 20 years too late. Uh, thanks for joining us in uh, 1980. Or pick any other year. Preposterous. Absolutely preposterous. And uh, shameful, in my opinion, for missing what was so obvious to so many and pretty much any black American, uh, according to me. You go ask them. If you don't know any, then go find some black folks and ask them how much they've been concerned about this threat most of their lives in every generation. And you shouldn't have to ask them and they shouldn't have to give you an answer because you have eyes and you have ears and you saw exactly what's going on. But you just chose to deny it, to ignore it, to act like it wasn't a horrific threat and tearing apart this country as it always has. And getting back to Trump, speaking of tearing apart this country, he's got a couple days left. And there was all this argument from Republicans about impeachment saying, why impeach him? You're just going to divide us further. Uh, wh- what else is he going to do? He's learned his lesson. Bullshit. He's going to lay out a whole bunch of pardons. He's going to execute a whole bunch more people is going to do nothing about covid he's going to potentially steal and then sell intelligence every minute of every hour of every day that he has remained in office he has posed a direct threat for so many different reasons it's not about politics it's not about what's politically expedient it's about america's national security and how can you not possibly see that at least some republicans did and voted against it in the house we'll see what happens in the trial in the senate but here on the sunday shows a couple of leading democrats were asked if they thought the president Trump should be allowed to continue to have access to intelligence of any sort after 12 noon on the 20th of January. Here is House Intelligence Community Committee Chairman Adam Schiff. He was on CBS's CBS News Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan anchoring. Some oversight of the intelligence uh, community. Sue Gordon, who I know you know, uh, one of the nation's top intelligence professionals for decades, wrote an op-ed yesterday in which she said President Trump is a security threat himself. And when he leaves office, he should be denied access to intelligence briefings. Would you urge the Biden administration to do that? Absolutely. There's no circumstance uh, in which this president should get another intelligence briefing, not now, 
uh, not in the future. Uh, I don't think he can be trusted with it now, uh, and in the future he certainly can't be trusted. Indeed, there were, uh, I think, any number of intelligence partners of ours around the world uh, who probably started withholding information from us because they didn't trust the president uh, would, would, uh, would safeguard that information and protect their sources and methods. And that makes us less safe. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen this president politicize intelligence, uh, and that's a, another risk to the country. All right, I didn't cut that off. The audio cut off where I pulled it from on Twitter. But I always giggle when the word country gets cut off. And it sounds like he just said it's uh, a risk to the cunt. And I find it funny. And I know it's an ugly word and people don't like to hear it. But I, I, uh, I'm sorry for giggling at that. Another risk to the country. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Congressman Adam Schiff. He's great. I like him. But uh, the same question was asked to Angus King on CNN. I think John King. Are they related? John King was talking to Angus King, his father, uh, the main independent senator, Cox with Democrats. He asked him the same question about the same op ed from that intelligence expert, Sue Gordon. Uh, and should the president maintain his access to intelligence? Here's Angus King with his son, John King. It is the president's call about whether Donald Trump gets access to pretty much anything in the post-presidency. Should Joe Biden say, cut him off, he's dangerous? Yes. I mean, there's, there's a certain irony here because this is a president who's become somewhat famous for not paying attention to intelligence and not really taking the daily brief that he's supposed to take and not really being very interested. But yes, uh, there, there's a grave danger of him uh, inadvertently or willfully uh, revealing classified information that would compromise sources and methods. And there's no, there's no upside. There's no reason that he needs to have this information. It's a courtesy that's been passed on from president to president, but there's no legal requirement. Uh, and, and I think given his uh, past history of of being fast and loose with intelligence data, uh, uh, it, 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 it ought to be that that ought to be a, an easy decision for the incoming president. And while I'm making fun of people misspeaking and you should make fun of me every time I do it, my own daughter did it to me tonight. Then I, I do want to play uh, two gentlemen who both said erection instead of election in the past couple of weeks. First, former Election security expert in the Trump administration, Chris Krebs, said it. I think it was on 60 Minutes. And every single Republican on the Hill that continues to support these election, election irregularities <laughs> has to do the same thing. They have to denounce it and they have to come back to the middle. To his great credit and reputation, Chris Krebs went on Twitter, by the way, at C underscore C underscore Krebs and said, so that was awesome. On Face the Nation, I just said erection instead of election. I'm so bad at this. No, you're not, Chris. You're great. And I love that interview and keep it up. But you did say erection. And so I have to talk about it. And you know who else did? Sean Patrick Maloney. He was on MSNBC with Jonathan Capehart. I heard him say it, too. And now you do as well. Dealing with uh, COVID-19, mm -hmm. at least three members who were sheltering uh, in, 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 a, in the hours during the erection where insurrection were, <laughs> were apparently contracted COVID. Well, that's not being funny when he said that his uh, fellow Congress people uh, potentially attract, uh, contracted COVID because the assholes who wouldn't wear the mask in that closed room. Speaking of assholes, let's get to Lindsey Graham, who clearly had a conversation with Maria Bartiromo just before he went on air at Fox News and said, I, I'd like, I have to say something. Just ask me to speak directly to the president, and I'll share my feelings direct, because you know he's watching, Maria. Just here it is. I want to get back to uh, Joe Biden in a moment. I know that you had a message for President Trump this morning, Senator. Oh, how did you know that, Maria? How did you know? Yeah, uh, Mr. President, uh, your policies will stand the test of time. You're the most important figure in the Republican Party. You can shape the direction of the party, keep your movement alive. We need to understand uh, that uh, these are difficult times. I appreciate what you did Thursday. There are a lot of people He's urging the right to, him. to pardon folks who participated in defiling the Capitol, the rioters. I don't care if you went there and spread flowers on the floor. You breached the security of the Capitol. You interrupted a joint session of con uh, Congress. You tried to intimidate us all. You should be prosecuted to the full extent of, uh, of the law. And to seek a pardon of these people would be wrong. It would be, I think it would destroy President Trump. 
and uh, I hope we don't go down that road. They chose to go into that Capitol to file the Capitol. President Trump never said go into the Capitol and try to interrupt a joint session of Congress. That was the choice they make. They made, and they need to live with that choice. He didn't tell them to climb the walls and take their shirts off and and put luscious paint all over their hard torsos and wear horns. Uh, and he didn't say to wear them or do that. But I. I well, I like that. I like some of those 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 strong men that were screaming. President Trump didn't tell them to do that. He didn't tell them now go in there and take Nancy's podium, and make phone calls, and take pictures of documents and so on. I mean, he did tell them to go and uh, cause problems. I mean, that's exactly what he pretty much told them to do. Nonetheless. The big takeaway from that comment was, A, Lindsey Graham has can only talk to the president through a TV, and B, he was warning the president not to pardon any of the insurrectionists or erectionists. Oh, look, I did it too. But one of the reasons it's great that I do this daily podcast and news segment about the last 24 late at night is because I can see some of these late breaking stories and you can wake up to them in the morning, which is a great reason to press play on stand up for your first podcast every morning. Uh, Here is the headline at CNN just after 10 p.m. East Trump to issue around 100 pardons and commutations Tuesday. Now, I don't know if there's any reporting that says he's going to pardon any of the insurrectionists, but CNN reports President Trump preparing to issue around 100 pardons and commutations on his final day in office Tuesday, according to three people familiar with the matter. And you're hearing names like Julian Assange and Steve Bannon and this total creep named Dr. Solomon Melgan, who is a doctor, is in prison after being convicted of dozens of counts of health care fraud. And obviously his kids, his lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and probably himself. All right, here is the painfully white, still hanging on to Donald Trump spokesman Hogan Gidley on Fox News with uh, how he curse reliable sources. Uh, he is saying that the president... He can't make a statement because he doesn't have Twitter. So what could he possibly do? Pence, I know your job is to defend President Trump, but an awful lot of allies and even aides are saying his conduct on January 6th was wrong. Well, look, I mean, he's getting that information, too, from attorneys and from advisors who are telling him they have evidence of certain things. And so- but those attorneys and advisors don't have evidence of those things. They're just making things up. They're grifting him while he's grifting us. And what he does have is experts at the state and local level and, of course, at every federal government agency telling him that there were no irregularities that in any way affected the outcome of the election. And he fired them and just brought in crazier and crazier lawyers. So that's bullshit. So he's going to go out and say, here's what I know and here's what I've been told. The president doesn't make these things up, whether it be, um, you know, advice relating uh, to the coronavirus that he got from Dr. Fauci and Dr. Birx, or whether it be related to the way the election was conducted. He usually doesn't make that shit up because he's not creative enough. He usually hears other people say it, then he adapts and adopts it and uses his own language about it, and he constantly just touts that stuff. Of course he's making it up, or other people are making it up, and he's just boosting it and giving it credence. And if people tell him things he didn't want to hear, he'd fire them and bring on people with less integrity, which is hard to believe. This information is out there, and he's not just hearing it from advisors. Real Americans experience some serious problems during this election. Yeah, they were black voters who had to wait in line. You're not talking about the right voters. Your voters didn't have serious problems in this election. You're continuing to make them up. Ride or die till the end, Hogan Gidley. Uh, The media, though, are trying to have it both uh, both ways, Howie. On one hand, he should be censored by big tech and not be allowed to talk. Uh, He also shouldn't say anything because it's divisive. First of all, he's the president of the United States. He's allowed to talk. He could literally walk outside and all of the cameras from all over the world would run to him. He can go to the White House press briefing room and talk as much as he wants. He got kicked off of Twitter and Snapchat and everywhere else because he's a horrible person, constantly lying and inciting an insurrection. All right, last audio clip. This comes from, you probably heard this, but I can't hear it enough. Washington police officer, Metropolitan Police Officer Daniel Hodges. And how do you have faith to, after seeing all that and how you were treated, to keep coming back to this job and, and doing what you do? Oh, sure. If it wasn't my job, I would have done that for free. You know, it, was, it was absolutely my pleasure to crush a white 
nationalist insurrection. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm glad I was in a position to be able to help. So yeah, we'll do it as many times as it takes. It's just not the kind of thing you ever hear from a police officer. I, I just I, I think we our law enforcement in this country is fundamentally poisoned with white supremacy and it's a massive problem. And that that may not be politically correct to address either Chuck Todd and anybody else in media, but it is glaringly obvious, which is why I loved hearing from D.C. police officer Daniel Hodges right there. And I'll have to do a segment with some expert this week on coronavirus and try to reset Maybe we'll do a whole panel. Lots of questions I have about it. I keep forgetting things I've learned. It's so hard to keep track of the vaccines and the rules. I'm very excited to, to find out that my parents uh, got an appointment for the first week of February to get vaccinated. It was a huge relief to me. My parents, 74 and 76, I think. And they're going to drive up to the North Country and get their vaccinations in upstate New York. I think it's going to be probably like a three-hour drive for them. So, Oh, I'm counting down the days until, of course, the that that day, February 4th, my parents get vaccinated. Lots of other headlines just to mention regarding COVID. Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, thinks that 100 million doses in 100 days is absolutely doable. That's Joe Biden's goal. Joe Biden writing massive shifts in policy for the first uh, days in office. Los Angeles becomes the first county to surpass one million coronavirus cases. Congressman Lou Correa announced Sunday that he has tested positive for the coronavirus. Apparently, Phil Spector uh, died at age 81 of coronavirus. But experts are saying it's going to get far, far worse, worse than it's ever been before it gets better. The incoming CDC director says we can expect 500,000 COVID-19 deaths by mid-February. In the next, just the next month, another 100,000 lives could be lost to the disease. While some states have seen improved outlooks in their fights against COVID-19, others are struggling badly. At least 126,139 patients were hospitalized across the U.S. on Saturday, less than the record of 132,447 patients, which was just on January 6th. Lots more headlines to talk about COVID, but I got to get to your news dump. This is not politics. It's not COVID. It's the news dump, undercover stories because of politics and COVID. No, I don't think I like that news dump sound effect either. I'll keep looking until you send me the perfect news dump sound effect. Let's start with a terrifying story about a delicious snack if you like terrible snacks. Hot Pockets. More than 750,000 pounds of Hot Pockets are being recalled because of the possibility they contain, quote, pieces of glass and hard plastic. The question Hot Pockets lovers are asking is... How will we know the difference between the normal ingredients in a Hot Pocket and shards of plastic and glass? (laughs) The recall of the Nestle product was announced by the Department of Agriculture. Frozen food could, quote, pose a choking or laceration risk and should not be consumed. It can also damage your reputation and give you a heart condition with just normal consumption. So, for whatever it's worth. By the way, how many Hot Pockets is 750,000 pounds of Hot Pockets? How many pockets is that, actually? (laughs) Oh, I want to just keep talking about that story. Little Jim Gaffigan in there, of course. If you're going to have a story about Hot Pockets, you got to throw it in. Let me take you to New York City to tell you about a nice 70-year-old lady who is facing charges after officials say she was recorded on video attempting to slip her husband roach poison. The Queens District Attorney's Office said the woman was seen on surveillance footage squeezing a white powdery substance from a bottle with a red cap and yellow label in her husband's coffee. The statement goes on to allege that she was recorded retrieving a bottle from the cabin under the sink on two or three occasions. Well, I hope my wife's not listening to today's news dump. American legend Betty White is turned 99 and in an email to the Associated Press said, I can stay up as late as I want without asking permission. Apparently her birthday meal will be a hot dog and french fries brought in along with a bouquet of roses by her longtime friend and agent. She said, I'm blessed with good health. So turning 99 is no different than turning 98. <laughs> I love Betty White. Israeli authorities are saying they have advanced plans to build nearly 800 homes in West Bank settlements. The anti-settlement monitoring group Peace Now said that over 90% of the homes lay deep inside the West Bank, which the Palestinians see 
as a heartland of a future independent state, and over 200 homes were located in unauthorized outposts that the government had decided to legalize Israel stepping up settlement construction in the final days of President Trump's term. And that is going to be a problem. And the United States of America isn't the only country where lockdowns are controversial. In the Netherlands, where they're supposed to be, I think, one of the happiest people in the world, police in Amsterdam turned a water cannon on hundreds of demonstrators who were taking part in a banned protest Sunday against the Dutch government and its tough coronavirus lockdown. Also, police on horseback moved in to break up the demonstration on a large square ringed by museums, including the Van Gogh Museum and others. I mean, I've been there. That's crazy. Why wow, they're getting rough with their horses and water cannons. Those Dutch are brutal, those Dutch cops. Watch out. They don't let them get their uh, horses and water cannons on you. And I love this story. Uh, dating apps are now conducting their own investigations of the attack on the U.S. Capitol last week. They're identifying and removing anyone who joined the insurrection. The apps are also being used by customers as a tool to identify those who were in the mob, according to the Washington Post. So it was hard enough to get laid, maybe if you're one of these guys at the insurrection. And now you, you can't even be on a dating app anymore. <laughs> but that's, well, that's going to be very divisive for these people. Very worried. The IRS is delaying the start of tax filing season. The uh, IRS won't accept returns until February 12th. So going to be more condensed uh, this year. IRS said Friday they're pushing back the start of the season until uh, February 12th. Typically, you can start filing late January, but the usual deadline of April 15th will remain in place. IRS saying the delay is necessary to help it accommodate changes to the tax code that Congress approved in December and second round of COVID relief payments. Enough about that, and that is your news dump. Let me get to my guests joining me today. They are the co-hosts of one of the most important podcasts, I think, out there called Gaslit Nation. Gaslit Nation pod.com sarah kenzior and andrea chalupa they are writers they're experts on authoritarian states they have been right about so much warning uh, about the uh, election hacking before the 2016 election and they take a deep dive on the news uh, to give amazing analysis using historical precedent and context and of course their regular sharp insights on global affairs i highly recommend that you listen to them and what i wanted to do with this conversation with Sarah and Andrea was to profile them. I wanted to give them a profile. They haven't gotten profile from any big media outlets or magazines, I don't think. And I wanted to take you behind the scenes a little bit, introduce you to them and talk a little bit about their relationship with each other and the show. And that was my aim. I'm also going to share this on YouTube, youtube.com slash stand up with Pete at Sarah Kenzior at Andrea Chalupa. And we quarter this uh, before the new year, actually, I sat down with Sarah and Andrea and the audio, my audio on my side, something was an issue with it, which is one of the reasons I was holding on to it, because I wanted to try to sweeten it, but I couldn't figure it out. I wanted to get this out and share it with you to kick off this week of exclusively, primarily female guests, I thought. And what better to have these two women on, because they have been so important and done such exceptional work. I highly recommend you get their books. I think you should buy or rent Andrea's movie, Mr. Jones, about a journalist who risked his life to expose the truth about the devastating famine in Soviet Union in the early 1930s. Of course, get Sarah's books, The View from Flyover Country and Hiding in Plain Sight. And here now, my conversation with Sarah Kenzior and Andrea Chalupa. Andrea and Sarah joining me because I am such a fan of Gaslit Nation. Ladies, thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having us. Uh, Sarah, obviously, I've been talking to you forever. Andrea, it's great to finally meet you uh, on uh, on on Zoom. And uh, I'm I'm really I'm a little nervous to talk to you guys because I'm such a fanboy of Gaslit Nation. You we're should honored. be. Nervous. Thank you so much. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> Andrea, <laughs> we shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. <laughs> so, Andrea, let me start with you because we haven't talked before, and uh, I just want people to get to know uh, a little bit about you and your work. And I've already talked about it in the intro here, but I think that your like origin story, your parents, and your history and and, and immigration story is really fascinating. And I thought maybe you could just touch on that. Maybe I don't know how much you talk about it with with your own audience in terms of uh, the past. I know you talk a lot about Ukraine, but Talk to me a little bit about your your mom and dad and how you, how you ended up where you are. 
Sure, I'm always glad to chat about this. Um, is it, it's, it made me who I am in a very big way, including my career. So my mom and dad are full on Ukrainian. They were both born in refugee camps in 1945 in Germany. And um, they immigrated, so they, they spent their childhood in, in, a, in a UN funded supported refugee camp and then immigrated to the new world as, as children going, my, my, the first thing my mom saw coming into New York Harbor was of course the Statue of Liberty and she never forgot it for the rest of her life. So my parents lived that American dream. They both went on to achieve great things because we had such a good safety net back then for people like them. My father went on to become a neuroscientist and advanced brain and mind research. My mother, as a hippie art teacher, <laughs> she championed as a community organizer with no legal background. Um, she, she spearheaded both the child car seat law and the seatbelt law in California. And she did this uh, initially when she was pregnant with me. So she'd be this big pregnant woman waddling after state representatives in, in, in Sacramento. And she would change my diapers on a senator's desk. So a lot of who I am came <laughs> from, from that very early period and, in which, in, you know, growing up with my parents and watching them fight the good fight. And so for me, that gave me my outspoken nature and my faith in uh, that we do live in a country that stands for progress if you fight for it, if you organize for it. And it, of course, gave me my interest in Ukraine. I went on uh, to study Soviet history in college. I went to the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and then just showed up in Ukraine and lived there for half a year. I staked my career on this little known country that growing up, a lot of people assumed was Russia. And I didn't expect much from it, but it turned out to be quite convenient, unfortunately, when we had um, Paul Manafort, Putin's operative in Ukraine, come over to America and manage Donald Trump's campaign and seeing a lot of parallels between Putin's puppet who, uh, Yanukovych and Donald Trump himself. And I never ever would have dreamed to be in this position or that it would take me here. And I'm really still shocked by it. Yeah. I was actually just thinking about this this morning when I was blow drying my hair. I cannot believe this is all still happening. Mm. And um, in addition to all that, I've spent the last decade and a half uh, researching and writing a historical thriller, a film called Mr. Jones. Uh, which is directed by the great Agnieszka Holland, the three-time Academy Award nominee who gave us uh, The Secret Garden and, and other beautiful films like Europa Europa. And that film is available now on Amazon, iTunes, Cable on Demand, and it stars the great Vanessa Kirby and Peter Sarsgaard and James Norton playing the journalists that were covering Stalin's Russia during a time of his genocide famine in Ukraine, which my grandfather survived. It's such such a great film, and it's great to be a listener of Gaslit Nation and hear you talk about its development as well. That was a pretty cool thing. If you're interested just in film in, in general, you can you can speak to to that as well. You're you're now a Hollywood screenwriter. You can be an expert at talking about how to how to get a film made. But I I mean I could ask you so many follow ups about everything you just said, um, but let me just ask one, which is. Your parents grew up in a refugee camp. Like, couldn't they, haven't they written that screenplay, that book? What is, I mean, what does that, how do you talk about that? What's something that's interesting about that childhood? What is that like? No one can even, I don't even know what to ask because I can't imagine. Refugee camps are not all equal. They're not all the same. Um, but what was that? Well, what was amazing? So I, I interviewed my family as much as I could, um, I, I, I hunted down family members to find out like what, what exactly that to that, you know, to answer that question. And I put all that research together in a self-published book called um, Orwell and the Refugees, The Untold Story of Animal Farm. And uh, that book is significant because when I published it, just self-published it, that's how my film eventually came together. People found that book and reached out to me and a whole network developed a network of support, which eventually led to Mr. Jones, the film. And um, the most stunning thing I learned about my parents' experience is that the United Nations and, and the, the, the allied powers, they spent a lot of money back then on supporting these refugees. And they did that for the pragmatic purpose of keeping the refugees in place so they wouldn't go wander off and annoy mm -hmm. the general German population that couldn't stand them, that saw them as parasites. And so to keep tensions low, if you needed anything as a refugee, if you needed a piano, a sewing kit, art art supplies the un would give it to you 
So as a result, my, pa- my family growing up in this refugee camp, they had an exceptional education. So all these Ukrainians that were artists and scientists back in Ukraine, they self-organized a whole school system for people that went all the way up to the university level and their refugee camps even had conferences among each other, art and intellectual conferences. And it was so intense culturally that when my um, uncle went to high school in New York city, he was, he was so advanced in his, in his education that he, that he only had to take basically the bare minimum back then that he was passing tests because his education was so good in the refugee camp. And out of this uh, cultural fervor, uh, these refugees, a group of them found this little known writer in London by the name of George Orwell and wrote to him and said, we read Animal Farm because they were teaching themselves English. Uh, but, um, so they wrote, you know, we found Animal Farm. How did you know what we lived through when so many didn't know the truth? They wrote this literally in a letter to Orwell saying, who the hell are you? And so working with, with Orwell, they translated Animal Farm into Ukrainian. It was the very first translation ever of Animal Farm in any other language than English. And they would sell it in the refugee camps. It became required reading for the very first time in, my, in, uh, in the schools of the, in, in the refugee camp. And when my family uh, immigrated to New York, they could only take what they could carry. And they took with them George Orwell's Animal Farm in Ukrainian. And I still have it. That is fascinating. Orwell and the Refugees, the untold story of Animal Farm. I've got to read that. And I just want to you know, jump in here and say that my grandfather um, threw axes. If for he was a that, with that what timber I don't know but <laughs> like he, people or oh, like, yeah. like he, trees <laughs> he was like a hatchet guy like yeah that was his thing at, at like the fairs and stuff he would throw hatchet that's oh, that nice. my family let's I just take a, a scene in this in the, the latest season of the crown where Margaret Thatcher that right? forced to watch axe throwers and she gets <laughs> maybe, my that's grand, right. maybe my grand <laughs> maybe my family <laughs> is interesting. <laughs> The point of that is like your story is crazy fascinating and like mine like i don't have anything sarah cool. uh sarah i you guys have i think what because of what andrea just said in terms of like her background and her family and everything that's happening in the world and america and the election with trump she has so much credibility on a country and an issue that that makes that really makes it, it brings a lot of i think weight to her work and to your your podcast you of course have been a journalist and specifically a, a specialist unfortunately in a relevant thing authoritarianism and so i feel like you guys bring so much credibility to gaslit nation i think that's what makes the show the best that you actually really know what you're talking about. You have deep backgrounds, experiences, and, and, and great reputations. But how did you guys meet? And when did you come up with the idea for the podcast? Yeah, that's a, a funny story. We've told this a little bit um, before. We met because of a rumor about Trump having a sex tape taped by um, Russian intelligence services and, you know, brought into American political circles. And so I rem- I actually wrote about this a little bit in my book, Hiding in Plain Sight, that it was Halloween and I'd come back from trick-or-treating and suddenly my timeline looked like a John Le Carre novel. And, you know, I see Andrea's tweet on something I'd been wondering about for months, this rumor going around that, you know, Trump was taped in illicit sexual acts uh, in Russia and that this was being used as a form of compromise. And I thought, well, somebody's actually bringing this up. I'm going to just jump in and I'm going to finally say I've been hearing this too. And so I did. And from that moment on, we, you know, we started um, DMing each other on Twitter, comparing notes. Uh, We were both very, very concerned at this time about the national security of our country, about its sovereignty, about the election. This is like late October. So we were down to the wire. It was right after Comey had released his letter. I had been, you know, just screaming like all year. You know, my background, for those who don't know, is uh, in anthropology. I have a PhD in anthropology, but I studied the former uh, Soviet republics like Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, kleptocracies that I saw Trump running the U.S. uh, in the same vein of. And Andrea's perspective was from Ukraine, where you see a, a direct tie, you know, like my metaphorical tie by the end of that year, by October, had been revealed to be a direct connection. So we were both like hair on fire. And it was a profound relief to find somebody who understood this, somebody who I didn't need to explain what this former Soviet Union was to, somebody who I didn't need to explain the, the significance of Paul Manafort to. And so then um, on election night, I mean, I guess the first person I, I called in 2016 after uh, Trump, quote unquote, won the election was Andrea, who I'd never spoken to in my life. 
we were just uh, comparing notes about some incongruities we had noticed. And she says, you know, why don't you just call me? And it was like 3.45 a.m. And we, I called her and we were on the phone for like an hour. And we basically figured out the whole plot that then became the Mueller report that then became like, you know, four years of hell in about an hour. Like what he was going to do, who had helped him, who was who were his key backers, what was going to go down. Um, and then we were trying to stop it. Like we wanted a vote audit. And let me be clear, we wanted an investigation. We just wanted the truth about election integrity to be known. We weren't calling for like an overthrow of the government um, or something like that. The podcast was launched uh, in 2018, um, in part because, you know, I had been writing articles at that point. I had a book out, but the news cycle was moving very quickly. And the mainstream outlets were sort of skirting from topic to topic without context, without historical insight, without linking these different events together. And we felt like, you know, that was the big thing missing. And that's something that we can do very easily because we've been immersed in this uh, for a very long time, like before Trump took office. We were immersed in this. We're like the only two people in America whose jobs didn't change. And so, um, you know, we thought we didn't really think it would be uh, all that popular. You know, you get an Uzbekistan specialist and a Ukraine specialist and you don't expect um, like a hit. But it it has been. um, And we're extremely grateful for that. And, you know, we're going to keep going into the new administration. Yeah, I I will. I'll I'll get to where the podcast goes with the new administration. Uh, I'm really excited as a listener. But again, um, just resetting. I'm a fan of this show and I'm always trying to figure out what it is I like so much about it. And I, I, I think you're helping me understand. I mean, I guess I kind of already knew this, but the, you when you say we found each other, um, I think what's interesting about that is because of your backgrounds, you've talked to a lot of these people I'm about to mention, but it would seem that experts on authoritarianism, historians especially that are experts on it, um, when they overlap, especially with those who study uh, the former Soviet Union, Russia, and the tactics, techniques they use, and most importantly for you two, I would think, it's the players that you both know that have been involved here. To me, that's what makes it work because you understand the the history and of authoritarianism specifically in this region and you understand all of the players there because you're so deep in it so my question real quick is there are other people who have your similar credibility on these issues and the region and the history do you think is there ever wide disagreement because maybe i'm not looking hard enough but obviously you guys talk to tim snyder uh all the time timothy snyder yale historian there are people like masha gessen uh ruth ben giat um Kenneth C. davis just wrote a book called strongman so about the history of authoritarianism but there are a lot of people who know the history and know the region and i'm wondering andrea do, do they ever really like push back and disagree with with much of what you guys have been saying I think, well, so Tim Snyder is a dear friend of mine, and he was the historical advisor on my Mr. Jones, and he even introduced me to Agnieszka Holland. So I think, I think in terms of pointing out what needs to be said, the, um, Tim, uh, Ruth, uh, who wrote Strongman, I think we've been pretty much on the same page all these years. I would add Jason Stanley, a historian. Yes, at Yale, he's great. Who, who wrote a brilliant book called... Um, how fascism works, the politics of us and them. And I think largely what we saw the last four years, whether you were an expert on this part of the world or not, we did see just um, what existed in the early 1930s during the rise of Hitler and during Stalin's mass murder that he got away with, which was widespread conformity in the media where people were too afraid to be the one to stick their neck out and say, this is what's happening and, and, and people were afraid of being labeled alarmists. And there was pushback, certainly, by the, the quote-unquote realists. Even uh, the historian Ann Applebaum, who mm-hmm. wrote an excellent piece for The Atlantic that everyone should read that sums up perfectly She's great. Yeah. Uh, the, the history that inspired my film, Mr. Jones. It's called How Stalin covered up a famine. I believe it's in the Atlantic. She talks about that, how the realists were saying, yeah, hey, this, this is, is what happens. So I think there's just this effect of um, the frog in the pot of boiling water that gives into the normalization. And that can happen to so-called experts and experts and, and, and journalists that are um, that are strapped covering these horrific events as they're unfolding. 
uh, when in the early years when Sarah and I were really sticking our necks out because it, it hadn't dawned on most people uh, in the mainstream media that how bad this could certainly be. This was back in 2016, 2017, unfortunately, even like, like a, lo a lot of 2018. Sarah and I very consciously understood in that and the, the, the very moment when we came together, when when Trump essentially stole the election with the Kremlin's help, that we were going to be hurting our reputations, which would in turn hurt our careers. And, and, and then of course, there's the, the tricky problem of the Kremlin coming after you. So we knew, we were just like, all right, let's just do this. Cause we have, cause what choice do we have? Cause we know how bad it could get if, if we don't stop it. Yeah, well, hold on. I just want to interrupt to say you can't, you can't make the the kind of criticism you're making about other journalists and then also say what choice do we have. The choice you have is to not do anything. You you, you didn't we felt have, like we couldn't make that we choice make because that we choice. would end you up living in an authoritarian regime like the ones we've been studying our whole yeah, but lives. That's better than that's better than ha being targeted, having your family targeted. No, I think giving up your your independent thought and your creativity and your moral compass. That's the worst thing that you can do, which yep. is a big part of this. One journalist that I was talking to before she was heading back to Belarus this was before the, 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 the current ongoing protests, which are looking really good right now. Like they're in, in Belarus. Belarus. Yeah. Um, so before, before all that though, before the election, she was dreading going back to Belarus because she feared self-censorship. Mm. That's a big part of this. And I have to tell people that in 2016, 2017, 2018, it wasn't uncommon for some of these mainstream journalists to come to us privately especially when they're heading to Ukraine. They wanted to chat before going to Ukraine. And, and a lot of it, journalists would come to me and say, so what do the Russians have on Trump? Could you break it down for me? But then publicly, they wouldn't share our work. Publicly, they wouldn't associate with us. And it was this weird thing where we were just very unfashionable for a very long time. And, and we just assume we still are because it's just like, yes, we have a podcast, but it's like, you know, but it's us chatting away like we always have all this time. But um, we have to really stress to people that, um, first of all, they have to watch Mr. Jones to, to get the emotional experience of what I'm talking about, because this conformity is a big part right. of what the dictators wanting want to be dictators rely on when they're stomping on people on their way to power. Which is, you know, you, you did not fall for my uh, my my question um, or you 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 answered it perfectly. Like you can't you can't be that person because what you give up is not it's not worth living for. And I think but I think that most people probably have no idea, including journalists, uh, what you're talking about, because they never learned about that history. And they certainly don't know anybody who's lived under that kind of um, regime. And I think that that's what's really important about your perspective, Andrea, and your in your journalism Sarah, because you guys are explaining that to us. And as I've read more and more about it, I really I definitely get what you're saying now, but it's still hard. Have you if you've never lived under it and if you're not reminded by it um, and it's obviously really interesting to something that I think as a white guy that I don't really have to think about those. I, I can't relate those things. I'm not reminded all the time, but like Jewish people are always reminded, never forget black people just walk a day in there and their shoes, women in general, gay people, whatever. But like, I think a lot of people have just, you know, I've had an awesome life. Uh, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to compromise my family's security because it's, it's not worth it to me to, I'm not the, I could, I don't have any sources or anything like that. I'm not you guys, but I'm just, I'm just thinking that's probably how most journalists that are making really good money think like they, you I got think a that's good... part of it. They're very careerist. It's all about climbing this ladder and also about having the ability to just look the other way. You know, these aren't just white privileged journalists. These are people who live in a circle of white privilege. So they don't know people who are personally affected and they don't care about the broader community of Americans. They don't care what happens to black people, to Latino people, to any of the people that Trump was overtly targeting during his campaign. I mean, this is one of the things that was just very upsetting to witness. Like when Andrea and I would bring up criminality of the Trump administration and call for an investigation, call for indictments, we knew that one result 
of those indictments would be that people who are inflicting incredibly sadistic and cruel acts upon American people, especially those who were marginalized and targeted, those people would be stopped. They would have a better chance of being stopped. And yeah, they may be replaced with someone else, but still, you know, it's a good thing um, to get rid of them. And and the total lack of just, I, I don't know, awareness or interest in, in other people's well-being that weren't just their immediate social circle was really distressing um, to see. You know, and on that note, we have yet, I think, to have a listener um, who's black in America and has said the sort of things that our white listeners sometimes say, which is, but that's the law or, you know, checks and balances or what about the Constitution? They know there are multiple Americas and that different American citizens are given different rights, rights based on their background. And that that's the entire history of this country. That's how our institutions were founded. That's how things like the Electoral College were founded. And so it's like a, a relief, I think a mutual relief to have that sort of shared sense of understanding. But it's true tragic that we as scholars of authoritarian states abroad and also, you know, scholars of our own country uh, see this selective autocracy, um, you know, at a new height under Trump. But of course, you know, it's the culmination of a long series of discriminatory and cruel practices uh, that often get neglected by the mainstream press. When I listen to Gaslit Nation, um, you guys say a lot of things that are sometimes hard to believe. And so I generally look them up. I think that you suggest that to your listeners, that listeners should do that. But how do you see yourself in terms of uh, your role? You know, I think the danger in independent media is that we don't have editors and we don't have um, uh, uh, rules sometimes that we have to live by. And so you can say anything that you want. How do you see yourselves as journalists, as as writers, obviously? Um, and, and what do you think the issue might be there? Like, I know you guys issue corrections um, even to each other, sometimes on air. But h- how, how do you see yourself and what do you think? How, how should your audience uh, take the information that they hear on Gaslit Nation and, and, and do something with it? I mean, every episode comes with a Patreon page that has show notes, which has articles that we've cited with information. And we are always sure to include links to articles that might strike people as shocking. Like, for example, right. Russians, Russia's new weapon that can literally zap your brain. That sounds like something like we might make up. That sounds very dystopian. Um, you know, so we would put in links about those sorts of stories. Um, you know, I'm still in like PhD mode. Like my book, Hiding in Plain Sight, had like 35 pages of tiny, tiny endnotes. And so I know, you know, to say everything, both because it's the right thing to do, but also because as Andrea noted, we get attacked um, so much and by so many different people. People, <laughs> people from all sorts of uh, backgrounds with all sorts of agendas. So we know we need to show our work, and we know um, I, you know, as a researcher, primary sources are the best sources. So we right. use, you know, quite a bit of those. Uh, Trump's own words are often the most um, damning thing, and I think that they're the most uh, convincing thing if you're trying to, uh, you know, persuade a general audience about your argument. Um, But we mostly just, you know, kind of look through the news, see what we think are the most important topics. They're not necessarily the topics dominating the news. Uh, We stay away from horse race coverage and things like that, polls, uh, for example, because it's ephemeral, you know, it doesn't really um, matter in the long run. Uh, But we focus pretty extensively on especially national security or human rights issues that tend to go under the radar, but really, you know, rear their heads uh, later on. Andre, same question for you. About well, how you see yourself and how you will, how, what responsibility your audience should take when they listen to the program. Yeah, I think I think that's a great question. I think you know, I, I in terms of a journalist, I, I see it more as like the Martha Gellhorn, like fuck that objectivity shit. You know, it's sort of like when you're confronted with a concentration camp or a growing camp. Yeah, I hear this phrase "moral course. clarity" all the time being yeah, exactly. used by, by journalists. Yeah, just, I don't know just, that I get it. I mean, I do, but what, you're, I, I I get it. I think it's great. I think it's great, but I. What I mean by that is, could you explain what that means? Well, it's sort of, and I think. Um, I mean, you were just giving an example about the, you know, like something like the Holocaust or something. Right. Like you don't well, report objectively a, on. So there was this, there was a delegation of Russian journalists and editors, writers who came over. I bel- I forget which year it was. Um, in recent years, and they did a big pen talk. And the moderator, I believe, was from New York Magazine, and he asked a question to them, saying, "Well, didn't the the West?" 
uh, do its part in, in furthering these tensions with Putin. And the, the Russians on stage looked at each other, like they didn't understand the question. And finally one said, you know, sometimes things are black and white. Like sometimes, you know, basically saying like Putin is a menace, like Putin is a menace. Like there wouldn't be Russian sanctions if it weren't for Putin invading all these countries and mass murdering all these people. Right. So, right I get um, obviously, one thing we do is we don't hold anybody sacred. We go after all the, the personality cults. We call people out. We call out progressives. We call out moderates. Um, we call out the Republicans thinking they're now Democrats. You know, we call out everybody. And um, and it's just because we're having a conversation, first and foremost, between two friends. I think it's important for people to understand that Sarah and I would have these conversations regardless. Like, th this is what we sound we like. We just started recording them, basically. Yes, exactly. that's and, it. <laughs> obviously, there's more of a shorthand when we've talked. We've learned from making the show right. that we need to slow down our shorthand and maybe explain things for people that haven't been having this conversation uh, for years as, as long as we have. And, um, but, but this is who we are and these are conversations we have to help each other make sense of what's going on and to, and to connect all these larger pieces and to figure out, well, where's this going next? This is what we do as friends. We had um, our editor, our sound engineer over and, and, and we were going to record some episodes that day. And I was talking, chatting away with Sarah, making my bed, cleaning my room. And the editor finally said, oh, my God, this is how you guys actually talk to each other. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this, like, this is us making sense of the world and, I, and for the sake of our children and the sake of, of what we love. Do you guys ever talk about mundane shit with each other? I mean, before we started, we were talking about hair. You guys were being insensitive. Yeah, we, we're both oh, parents. We yeah. talk about kids. I mean, my kids are a lot older than Andrea's. We talk about TV shows. We both really like The Crown. I mean, we, we talk about UFOs. <laughs> this is not going to help me. They're Bonus conspiracy theories. Patreon is for all the stupid shit that gets us through life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We love those sorts of stories. The new story about the Galactic Federation. You know, we're like a sucker for, for anything like that. <laughs> The whole end game is that we work really hard through Gaslit Nation to establish a functioning, stable democracy for all, and that we've tackled climate change and human and trafficking and, yep. and um, modern day slavery and, and rebalanced you know, this horrible crisis of income inequality. Once we can get there, then Sarah and I can retire and turn Gaslit Nation to a show about aliens. Yeah, That's yeah. The whole goal. Well, I you, you, this is really hard for me because like I really ancient molders. I, I know <laughs> no I've, been seeing that. I've been seeing you guys talking about that, and um, I kind of am interested in it. I kind of want to talk about it, and I'm tempted right now to go down that road. But I've got like eight more minutes with you, and I really want to stay to the show because I have all these questions about Gaslit Nation and how it's developed. And I just really want to promote it and, and tell people to listen to it because I'm such a fan and I think it's really important. And I have, it's, it, it's helped me so much to connect the dots, to give me kind of like, I feel like I have like an, an associates now at least <laughs> in, in a certain type of history and authoritarianism because I've listened to your show so much, but um, how has it developed over the, the couple of years that you've been doing it? How has it changed? And I'll put you on the spot by saying, and you'll, later you'll be like, oh, I should have said a different episode. Like, is there any special episode that uh, you would say folks should go back to listen to to get kind of a background, a really an important issue or education on um, how is it developed and what episodes would you plug? I'll start with you, Andrea. I would say our classics are the first three episodes where we look at 2016 as a crime scene because it shows all of the systems that allowed tr that the Trump and the Kremlin took advantage of to come to power. And then we did an episode in, in uh, I believe September 20, September, October of 2018 called Robert Mueller will not save you. And that goes into how Robert Mueller is not going to save you, which turned out to be true. Right. It's a controversial uh, claim at the time. It was controversial at the time. We got a lot of heat for that. But we were like, no, he's, he's going after this low hanging fruit. Whereas Jared and Ivanka, who ran the, the Trump campaign, which accepted help from the Kremlin and hired Putin's operative to manage it for a time. Um, and then ran the tr transition team, which Michael Flynn said told him to call the Russians. Um, so so that's a key episode. And not only is it key for that whole angle of Robert Mueller, but also we do a deep dive, I believe, if my memory is correct, on how white and male newsrooms are across America. We do a big we, we do a whole list of research looking at that and, and why that's important that we all understand that we're getting our news through a white male lens. And, and it's because white 
men and women aren't going to be on the front lines of authoritarianism when it comes down the pipe. And it's the right. communities of color right. that have been living with an authoritarian police state reality for several generations. Uh, it's really, really, I'm glad that you, uh, that's a great answer. Uh, everybody go back and listen to those episodes. What would you add, Sarah? And how um, would there's one recently also? we did called the good Germans. That was very popular where we basically listed a lot of the uh, institutions that have enabled Trump and how that process works, how the, you know, sort of frog boiling in the pot of hot water works. There's an episode from um, March, 2019 called impeach normalization that we cited Again and again, because that was the week that sort of everything began to collapse for the prospect of democracy in America, like Barr had ended the Mueller report. Pelosi said she wasn't going to impeach. Manafort was proclaimed an otherwise a citizen who led an otherwise blameless life. Like all these things were going wrong. Uh, We really laid it out on the table. Um, We also have a number of episodes about key figures uh, like Roy Cohn. Um, My phone is is sort of, uh, you know, we have we have one. I just want to mention this one thing I can't find it. But you can sort of see how Gaslit Nation is ahead of the mainstream media. Um, For example, in June 2019, we have an episode called Will Giuliani Be the Manafort of 2020, in which we revealed like the entire impeachment case in May. Uh, I mean, I was going to interrupt you because in early 2019, we did an episode predicting the crime that would get Trump impeached. Yes. Bribing, pressuring Ukraine to invent a corruption scandal. And that was early 2019. I believe the episode's called Lisa Page. Yes. Yeah. yeah. First was Lisa Page. And then we explicitly named Giuliani's part. And then it, around September, Congress finally did something. And the whole time we're just like, what the? I mean, that's honestly, I mean, a lot of the emotion that comes through the show is me and Andrea being so frustrated because yeah. we're laying all this out very like clearly and anybody love- can pick it up and they're just not doing it. They're not, we cannot enforce accountability. We cannot make a citizen's arrest. If Andrea and I could do that, I mean, a we lot would. of people oh would God. be having problems right now. Um, I- we can't, we can just tell you what's going on and you can use that information for good, hopefully. And plenty of people are not just choosing not to, but they, you know, sick harassment um, mobs on us and so forth. And so that's, that's very frustrating. And I- obviously I- other people do appreciate it and we appreciate that you appreciate it. Yeah, no, I I also another thing I appreciate is that both of your emotions come through on Gaslit Nation every episode. And I think it's really important for for people who are influential, intelligent people that are in this case, co-hosting a podcast for that to be. And like, I feel like um, and I know I can relate to this just from having done it for 14 years. But like your your audience really knows you as a person. They know kind of what your moral code is as a person. And uh, that's not something that we know about most people that we listen to or watch over the years. You don't really even know anything about their personal life. But I, I think the humanity and the emotions come through. And I I had that jotted down in my notes to, to make sure I mentioned that. So I also think I've got to say this. I think it's crazy. You know, like there's so much that you predicted and that I think that in that enhances your credibility as opposed to a lot of journalists and pundits say a thing's going to happen and it never happens with economics or foreign policy. And then they still get the biggest opportunities and, and, and so on. And you guys have had so much of what you predicted and analyzed could m- maybe happen. And I think you generally couch it that way actually, unfortunately happen, which I think makes your audience think, you know, so much more of your credibility, but I will say I, it's astonishing that in one episode last year, That Sarah, you predicted that Rudy Giuliani would have hair dye running down his face. And Andrea, you predicted that a fly would land on Mike Pence's head (laughs) in a debate. And I don't know, nothing about your background says that you would know those things. So now I'm starting to think. It's only the really critical things like that that we (laughs) we can nail. (laughs) Um, Okay, so how, how do you, this is another stupid question, but again, as a listener and as someone from media, I have to know, like, you guys are co-hosts of the show. It seems very equitable. It seems very respectful. You, you, if you disagree even slightly or push back, no one would ever think there's a run. You guys seem to really like each other and respect each other. And the way that you do the show, one, one of you talks for a long time, the other listens and then talks for a long time. And the other one talks and that's weird. It's not suggestible. <laughs> Um, it, uh, media experts would say, don't do that. Sometimes you read for long periods of time, Like you go against all of the grain of broadcasting. And I think podcasting to some extent allows that, but you guys get away with it. it, it be, not get away with it. 
you guys are so um, good at talking that it, I'll just keep listening no matter what you're talking about. I feel like if you veered into like a conversation about which crackers are better, Ritz or we things, I'd be like, holy shit, <laughs> that is really interesting, that take. But how do you, my question, Andrea, is uh, wh- when are you guys going to like have a major fight and break up? How come you get along so well it's and do this show so well together? What's the so, deal? So two things. There are no short phone calls with Sarah. If I need to call Sarah for any reason, I need to make a one hour commitment. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we that's how we talk. Like the, the show is us in real life. Like when we get on the when we get on the call to record the episode, we'll just check, you know, just start chatting away and an hour will go by and we'll be like, oh, we should have probably recorded that. So yes. we'll start the show that happens every week, practically. Yeah. And um, the other thing is when we do fight and it got really dicey when we first launched the show because it was like it was not it was supposed to be a side project a short term side project Mm -hmm. and it turned out to be a lot harder and all consuming than we expected Uh. and also the like the audience reaction was really overwhelming like we like it emotionally knocked us out to to have this energy with people connected with us. Can you be more specific and, and, and be less modest? Well, some of it is just the intensity of the topics. I mean, it's a show about fascism, human rights violations, you know, <laughs> yeah. sadistic, most horrible people in the world. When you talk about that every yeah. week, yeah. and you also have to do it in a way that doesn't terrify people into an action that still keeps them motivated, but mm. is realistic. It's a very fine like blind to walk. And sometimes we have to leave out what we actually think is the absolute worst thing that might happen. Cause we know that like no one would ever sleep again. And so hmm. it's just a lot of pressure. And in the beginning, yeah. as you might have noticed, and you have clearly noticed, we didn't know what we were doing and we still completely don't. So it's like, add that, like the emotional strain on top of just learning how to run a podcast, finding some audio editors, like figuring out what to do with this big audience. We had all of a sudden it, it was yeah. weird. I think I think it was really shocking because we expected our moms to listen and we expected all the usual hit pieces making fun of us. And just to realize that there are people out there that felt the same way, that had their own stories to share. And there's so many of them and they and they kept coming and it felt really overwhelming. Like we were just, oh, my God, like this is a thing now. And um, and so we had to figure out how to sustain it. And that was a big challenge because we really did not know. what we're. I'll I'll say this. Like, I didn't feel the same way. I didn't have a big background and I didn't really know what you're talking about. But listening to your podcast, I'm sure lots of people are like me. They started to feel the same way. And that could be true probably of any any show could be true. And and you could probably explain how that's how, you know, controlling people works, but that's not what you were trying to do. You were trying to give information, which made me start to feel the panic and understand the issue better. Thus making me feel the same way as a listener. Thus again, (laughs) can you do that? Uh, Making me want to not miss an episode. I mean, it's, Uh it's, it's like you relate to and think it's super important the way that you're connecting the dots with all of it. But I interrupted there. So like, I think you were talking about like what the problems were at at the beginning, but it was really funny. So we learned, so Sarah and I had a fine relationship leading up to the podcast and everything was fine. And it was really funny because when things got dicey and we're like, oh my God, this has, this is big. This is a big project and um, we have to figure this out and um, keep it going. And because we felt this sense of sudden like obligation to people, like we have to keep, keep it I going. get it. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. And it, and it was, it was horrible. It was like, we're stuck. <laughs> we're like, we're stuck in this podcast now. And, um, and I remember like we had a, like a, a day where we just started fighting and screaming at each other. But what was really funny is that we quickly realized that we were screaming this, like the same exact thing. <laughs> and I was like, wait, you're making the same point I'm making. Like, it's the oh, stupidest it's, fight. It's, 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 yeah, the it's, that's stupidest funny. Fight. It's great. Yeah. It's as soon great. as we realized soon as we realized that, that so we don't even bother fighting anymore because we know we think yeah. the same way about the issue which is a matter of just get skipping the fighting and just going straight to the well i have two more hours worth of questions i hope we can do this again and get more specific uh, i'll do this anytime with you guys because i never run out of, of questions just like your listeners don't it's never enough each episode it's like wait what about this what do you think about this um and i know that you offer that to your patreon uh members so people should subscribe and support you so congratulations on i think 
what I, my point of view, it's a, it's a massive success, your podcast for, you. for all of the right Thanks. reasons. And so the final question for both of you is what is the kind of craziest outcome or most flattering or maybe even weird thing that a listener slash whatever you want to call them, fan supporter has done? Because the kind of typical, typical things like the, I think the most extreme are a tattoo, a Gaslit Nation tattoo. God forbid they get, you know, one of your faces because I think that would be creepy. Um, <laughs> but maybe naming a kid uh, or like what is the most um interesting thing listeners have said or, or, or done as big fans of Gaslit Nation, the podcast. And I you. mean, one thing I've seen is, you know, I, I said this on the show and I've said this in you know other contexts as well. It's just this line. This is a transnational crime syndicate masquerading as a government. At different points, I've seen people on TV at protests chanting that somebody made a line of T-shirts with Gaslit Nation and my face on it, you know, saying they're giving the proceeds to Gaslit Nation. I should probably check on that uh, with that phrase. And so, you know, if you had told me a decade ago that your catchphrase will be this is a transnational crime so to get masquerading as a government and it will come from your podcast about Donald Trump and the Russians, I'd be like, what the fuck? And then it would be on a T-shirt. Like, it's, it's very weird. I mean, everything about this situation is extremely strange. Like unanticipated yeah yeah, yeah, that way. yeah i think we've been living in this surreal bill and ted's adventure for a very yeah. long time now i never thought of it that way but yeah that is we're like the wild it. stallions really of podcast and, and, anything uh, you would add about like what fans have done or said or an outcome you know that's kind of cool flattering whatever art, under- there's an amazing artist who makes gorgeous like i would hang one of these beautiful modern art uh paintings that he does with gaslit nation in the background and it and it, and it looks to be like cool gorgeous colorful art so i wish I, I knew his name off the top of my head but i would buy one of those paintings have you shared them have, with yeah, uh, think, yeah we retweet yeah. all this stuff oh, cool. and there's songs there's also we have a lot of creative fans very creative fans and they it's the very art, cool that they do all this poetry, stuff and that's what we love we love it's an it's an exchange of energy that's why it was. That's why it floored us at first because we didn't expect to get such an exchange back. But that's how we see it. it's like this exchange is a community that exchanges support for each other and energy. And obviously, we're excited about anybody that does anything. That's a gesture of like I'm staying engaged. I'm going to create something. I'm going to build something. That is so extraordinarily exciting for us. Um, we've heard people running for office for the first time that never ever saw themselves wow. running for office. That's huge. That is huge. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so for us, and when people knocking on doors for the first time, they've never done that or making phone calls for the first time, all of that is what we live for. It's like, that is what keeps us going to do. That. Yeah. You guys have done a great job uh, focusing on and promoting the, the Georgia runoff elections on your show. You've made that a real centerpiece and, and, and you've actually not only wa- uh, talk the talk, but you've organized and you know you're, you're doing all kinds of contests and motivating people it's so important um and i have a million more questions including what's next for the the podcast but i know you have other things to do and have to go what is next for the podcast i think we covered i think it's, it's based i mean look trumpism is here to stay income inequality shut up is- <laughs> don't say that yeah, I think about telling the truth on Gaslit Nation. It's not here to stay. It's going away because he's going away and they're going to kill his Twitter account and then no one will care. Yeah. So we've got our work cut out for us for at least the next decade plus. So <laughs> we feel like we win either way. If the things that we talk about become irrelevant, that means the world has become like a paradise. So we get to benefit from that. So either way, we're fine. Yeah. Like the sooner, we're either gainfully employed or living in, you know, a wonderful, yeah. <laughs> a wonderful new America. Exactly. The sooner Gaslit Nate, so the sooner Sarah and I can have our podcast about aliens, the better for yeah. all of humanity. Andrea Chalupa and Sarah Kenzie your Gaslit Nation. I highly recommend it. I know so many of my listeners have, have been listening, but if you haven't, you have to check it out and sign up to support them on Patreon as well. You guys, you guys sell some swag, don't you? I saw a t-shirt. We have a store. If you go to GaslitNationPod.com, there's a, a Gaslit Nation store. There's mugs and there you shirts go. and stuff. And yeah. Thank you guys so much. Keep up the good work. Thank I really appreciate so the opportunity to, to, to get to talk to you. Thanks for having us on. There it is. That is it. Andrea Chalupa and Sarah Kenzior. Check out Gaslit Nation Pod. That's GaslitNationPod.com. Follow them on Twitter and let them know you appreciate them sitting down with me. Again, that was a couple of weeks ago, but that was great. And I'm going to try to profile other people as much as I can and and give them more attention and and hope, obviously, that they uh, give me attention with the show that we're doing every day here. 
but I always love to try to spotlight people who I think are doing great, great work. So thank you to both of them. And that is all I have for you today. Let me know who you'd like to hear from the rest of the week. I've got a couple of guests booked, but again, exclusively trying to bring in women this week because I've been so male dominated on my guests. And so who would you like to hear from that you haven't heard from ever before or in a long time? Who are some of your favorite people who join me regularly? I've reached out to my friend Rebecca Vallis and Midwin Charles and Maura Quint. But who else would you like me to have on this week? Who are your favorite lady guests uh, that join me here on Stand Up or that haven't before that you'd love to have join me? Let me know. Stand up Pete at gmail.com. All right, that's it. Out of time. Talk to you tomorrow right here on Stand Up. Anytime on the Discord chat, Wednesday night, 8 p.m. for subscribers. If you're not a subscriber, Please sign up now for as little as five bucks, or you can always edit your subscription up to 10 or 25 or more. Thank you very much. Talk to you tomorrow. When the tyrants taunt you and the sirens teach you, better stand up, stand up. Let the brave meet the challenge, let the meek weak flee. Boy, you better stand up, stand up. When you're tired of begging, saying pretty please, that's the time you gotta find. They get up on your knees When you can't see the forest full the burning trees You got to stand up Hey, you've been sitting so long You got the creaky knees You got to stand up Stand up I think you're driving wheels With leaking grease Boy, you better stand up Stand up Well, there's a whole lot more of us Who know us right They'll keep right on ignoring us If we keep we got to open up the window to let in some light. You got to stand up. That's right. You got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eyes. We got to let him know it's his turn to go. See it clear and all you hear is a lie. Don't get up off of your butt. Get down off of your fence. And even if it ain't a very friendly audience. Start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town. Just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down. Boy, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. She's the place where every lost child will finally be found. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with the causes for laws and since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up Alright, we got to speak up We got to preach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and he'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up stand oh, up got to stand up oh, come on just stand up everybody got to stand up in the darkest hour stand up people got the power stand up come on come on come on come on come on come on
self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream.